Good evening, everybody. Shalom. Buenos días, buenas tardes. We are waiting a few more minutes for more people to join us. Okay, so we'll get started. So thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, it has been six months since we awoke to the deadliest day for Israel in its 75 years history. In addition to murder, Hamas strategy involved systematic sexual and gender-based violence designed to destroy and inflict sadistic terror. I'm sorry, I'm a bit sick. And around 1,600 Israelis have lost their lives, including 604 soldiers. Around 11,000 people were injured. About 600 were hospitalized at Adassa, and 85 were treated in the rehabilitation units. Since then, we've been dealing not only with grief and loss, but with an ongoing war. 90 a thousand displaced individuals from border communities. We are still praying and hoping for the immediate return of 133 hostages held in Gaza. There has been a worldwide explosion of antisemitism, rallies, verbal attacks, incidents of physical violence, vandalism, and support for terrorism. International organizations and countries have been turning their backs on us, specifically those who are supposed to defend women and human and sexual rights. And we still have challenges ahead of us. So how our goal tonight is to share with you some of the things we have experienced and learned, how we cope, how we seek and find resilience as individuals, families, communities, and medical and mental health professionals. People adapt to adversity in different ways, and belonging, connectedness, and hope are some of the things that keep us strong. We want to thank Adasa International for hosting this event. To Adasa Top, Jean, Shir, to Lydia. I also want to thank Tanya Oren Chipman for the help in the organization of this event and our uh, incredible speakers. Uh, before I present our first speaker, uh, I want to uh, show you, to remind you that in case you want to see captions, th there's a tiny sign, CC sign in the bottom of your um, screen. So you can click on that button and you'll see captions. And we are supposed to get um, a translation into Spanish very soon. I hope that in a few seconds we can figure that out so we can have our translation. So again, thank you everybody for being here. Our first speaker is Kai Isekson, and she will talk about understanding the sequela and consequences of torture and rape as weapons of war. Kai is a clinical psychologist, is a former director of the Survivors of Torture Unit and the International, International Institute in of New Jersey. She's a head psychologist at Letzideh in Beriakov Hospital for the treatment of uh, complex post trauma disorder and eating disorders. Kai, please. So, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to have my presentation coming up. Um, Can you put the presentation on? Okay. So um, as uh, Michal uh, was saying, uh, we are going through a very difficult time here and I would like to share some of my uh, uh, learning and experience uh, in, in New Jersey where I was working with uh, survivors of torture and here where I am working with survivors of uh, sexual violence. 
Uh, I think that uh, my presentation will be um, giving uh, some kind of frame of reference to try to understand uh, all the all the complexity that we are going through, and from there to give some of examples about the things that we are going through. So I would hope that uh, uh, we can go um, now, if you can go for the next uh, slide, please. So the definition of torture, yeah, the United Nations defined torture as any act of severe pain or suffering that is inflicted on person, uh, whether physical or mental, and is intentionally inflicted in the with the purposes of obtaining information or confession or punishing a person or somebody else for something that has been committed or intimidating or coercing for any reason based on discrimination of, of any kind. And the pain is um, inflicted with the consent and the acquiescence of a public official or somebody that is acting in an official capacity. So we go to the next one, please. Next slide. So the, 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 the history of torture is, uh, is indeed dark and traveling over all the human history and spans across all the cultures and time periods. And uh, our program in the in New Jersey was a program that was like a thermometer of you know any place that was going through a difficult time. We were getting uh, some uh, uh, refugees or people that they were coming for us. So we see this uh, from ancient civilizations to modern ones. The practice of the practice of torture is being employed uh, with different uh, purposes, but always with the same uh, aim to inflict intense suffering on individuals. Uh, the specific motivations can differ, but they're mostly uh, they are trying to cause pain and submission, and they are used uh, most of the time by oppressive regimes, by authoritarian governments, and by groups or individuals that are seeking power or dominance. This, the torture is still used uh, to try to suppress political opponents and to obtain confessions. But during the time I and mean, in the last uh, in the last decades, we are seeing this as an expression of the humiliation or destruction of unwanted elements in certain societies, as happened in the most severe forms of genocide that we saw in Armenia, in Rwanda, or in Bosnia. The next one, please. The torture is the most extreme violation of the human rights. It's a brutal and dehumanizing experience. And the, the, the purpose is to bring the victim to the situation that, that the person cannot exercise any legitimate power and right to control of their lives. They are under constant scrutiny, under forced labors, are under sham executions, under sensory deprivation, interrogation, sexual harassment, pain, forced position. So I would like to share with you uh, some of the um, the evidence of some of the the, the um, one of our hostages that came back. That the, her name is uh, uh, Yarden Gat. If you can please put uh, the um, the YouTube uh, part where she's uh, talking about you know how she was under con constant scrutiny. Yeah. This is a um this was done in the 60 minutes. And I think that hope that this is working. If it is not working, I can say this, whatever she said. Okay. So so she was saying that she was she she was alone there, she was without her, she she was uh, kidnapped uh, from the kibbutz and she never she was kidnapped uh, and she was alone, but she said, I was alone, but never I was alone. I have a guardian with me from the second that I got to Gaza to the second that I was, uh, that that she was released to us. Uh, and that what she was saying, that she was, um, um, she was used as a trophy. She was um, being a show in the, in the, in the, in the Gaza streets as, 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 as a trophy from, from the kidnappers and, and they, they were feeling that the, the, she was absolutely scared and uh, that she was going to be uh, abused, that she was going to be 
rape that she was going to be used as a as as a, as a model of uh, of the cruelty that they were using, and they were um, that they were trying to dis to display. What we are seeing that is that the effect of the torture is pervasive over the victim's family, the friends, the colleagues, and all the community. And we see this uh, with us when we are today, we are a society that we are, all of us, we are uh, in some way traumatized with whatever is going on. And we are all of, all, all Israel is waiting for the hostages to come. And we are constantly praying and uh, and going to to demonstrations to try to to bring them back it's like we are all suddenly we are all in this together the torture must most of the time use methods that there are in total contradiction to the social to the social norms and belief and the the aim is to create that sense of terror of alienation of shame and guilt the next one please so when they are creating this sense of guilt and shame they are constantly you know invading invading the physical boundaries and the right of privacy is violated uh this uh this situation is weakens the person's capacity to fight back and what we see in our program is that this is not only at the act at the time of the act but right and much more longer the effects are on this on, on the people the psychological dimension of tortures appear to be have two universal dimensions one is the loss of control and the other one is the loss of the known world. Uh, I think that the loss of the known world is now that is something that is a pervasive effect because I think that most of us, we have the same sense now, all the people that there are in Israel, that we lost um, the ability to believe in all the things that we believed before and probably for all the Jews in the, in the world, the sense that... Uh, that they had that Israel is uh, powerful and that uh, there is a place that, and that, is, uh, that has all the possibilities to always uh, protect the Jewish people had some kind of rapture. So the torture, uh, what is uh, um, damaged is the sense of personhood, the community and all the, so the society, societal values. And the, the, the torture is systematic. You know, the way we know that there are manuals how to do the torture and then most of the places that they are doing they, they they read and they know what to do and most of the time it's physical and psychological forms that they are using and they are most of the time perform at the same time when the intention is to uh, destroy the physical and psychological well-being of the victim not only at the time of the torture and but for for long time into the future too the next one please so in captivity, victims are often dehumanized and treated as objects by their captures. This is what uh, Amit Susan, uh, Susanna, that is another one of our hostages, she was saying she felt like she was used as, a, as an object. She was uh, tied for three weeks uh, to the bed and she was constantly checked to see if she has a period because she, they were preparing for, for, for rape her. Uh, so the, the victims are often dehumanized and treated as, as, as objects. They are stripped of their agency, of, of the dignity and the basic human rights, and, and they're becoming a commodity to be exploited and traded. So this is part of what we are seeing now. There are constant uh, negotiations about the trading of uh, our hostages. Um, the hostage is also being subjected to uh, a lot of expressions of power and frustration of the captures. And they are compelled to comply with the captures demands because this is the only way to survive. These situations may lead to may, may lead to the loss of the victim's sense of self and privacy, the viol violating of the basic principle for relationship, trust, intimacy, and humanity. The next one, please. So the victim is exposed to repetitive trauma events. Uh, is completely dependent on the abuser who has total power over his or her life. Uh, they control every aspect of the hostage life from the basic physical needs to the mental and psychological communications. Uh, they are in a, a profound internal struggle. Uh, they have the hostage between them because they need in some way to comply, to comply with everything that they are being asked. But this is against their own uh, needs and their own needs, uh, so um, their own, uh, you know, beliefs. So it's uh, constantly creating a lot of a psychological, uh, you know, um, disruptions. 
they feel weak and helplessness and they are uh, and they feel and then they feel that they lost their autonomy and their competence uh, and the other part that is very important about captivity is that they don't know when this is going to be finished when when they are going when when this is going to end so there is a perpetual dread and, a, and an existential uncertainty and they are undermining that undermine the sense of identity, resilience, and hope for the future. Next one, please. So the major characteristic of captivity, there are the loss of communication with the outside world, the harsh physical conditions, the inadequate uh, shelter, food, and medical care, the loneliness. This is what they call the silence experience. They have a lack of human connection and a meaningful connection. They cannot talk about what they are going through. They, there is nobody that is going to give them any kind of validation. They, um, they have a very uh, difficult relations with the captors. What they are that they are lack of empathy, compassion, or humanity. Uh, they are feeling insecure and mistrust, and from there they have the, the long-term problems in the in trusting in interpersonal relationships, and they most of them they have uh, uh, symptoms of withdrawal because this is something that that gets a big mark in the soul. Uh, this, these conditions always precipitate uh, depression, post-trauma, other psychiatric uh, disorder, disorders, even uh, psychotic symptoms, uh, suicidal ideation, phobic disorders, substance abuse. So there is a long, there is a long term cost about what the people that are going through these uh, situations there and they they really pay. The next one, please. So in the long terms, we have a metamorphosis of the soul. We have, uh, in the most extreme cases, we have the collapse of the identity with feelings of disorientation, the personalization, uh, feeling that they are going crazy. They are feeling that they are losing the meaning of life. Many of them, they have a uh, suicidal ideation. Uh, they feel that the life doesn't have really any 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 value in these situations. And one the problems is that this is uh, something that happened uh, to be passed to future generations and what we call the intergenerational trauma. This is something that we see a lot, you know, with the, the silence surrounding the trauma and prevent open communication, emo emotional processing. And this is something that is uh, passed through the other generations too, that they are growing up in this kind of uh, uh, houses where there is also, a, also anxiety and frightness or that they are not going and uh, not being able to maintain any kind of uh, adequate level of responsiveness to the children, or that they are minimizing the child the children experience because they think that they are uh, putting them the experience in the in uh, some kind of uh, uh, perspective of their own trauma. So nothing seems to be so important. Um, this is uh, what the Daniel is talking a lot about. You know the 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 silence after silence, the conspiracy of uh, the silence after that the survivors are coming back. She works a lot with local survivors, but also with survivors of torture. And she's talking about these adaptional, uh, adaptional uh, patterns that people and that have a, uh, go through very um, long term victimizations that they are um, being pass through the descendants and resulting in a legacy of trauma that shapes family dynamics and individual well-being. And they have, and we know now from all the research too, that there are uh, change in the epigenoma. So there are change in the molecular imprints that influence the gene expression and impacting the mental, emotional, and physical health of future generations. If you can pass the next one, please. So when we are talking about sexual violence as a war tactic, the next one. So rape of women is used as a tool of war and it was used all over the years and it served always to uh, some kind of political, economical, social or religious um, you know, um, um, group over another. The rape in war is not necessarily related so much to sex, but it's a display of power and the dehumanization of women. And the, by international standards today, rape in conflict is recognized as a war crime, as a form of torture, and is linked in many situations to act of genocide. The next one, please. 
So the rape in war intends to destroy the social fabric of the of the conquered population by driving a wedge between the polluted females and the emasculated males. Across different cultures, rape is often perceived as a dishonor, not only for the person that was for the individual victim, but for the entire family and the community. And the rape is always as a message of the weakness, especially for the men who are perceived as being uh, feminized or unable to protect not only themselves, but also their women and their daughters. The next one, please. So the, effective, the effectiveness of rape as, a web, as, as in war rests upon the norms about, you know, the place about high value of the sexual purity of and the virtues of women. But they has a very um, and much more um, difficult effect when the, and the effect multiplies when the women become pregnant. So the attack is passed on to next generations and perpetuates the legacy of violence and domination across generations. Um, many in, in the in many of the in the genocides that we saw, especially in Bosnia and in, in Rwanda, the women were forced to give birth to the child who was supposed to be ethnically cleansed with the blood of the rapists. And what we saw is that these uh, these women are they have a lot of difficulty to take care of these children that they are reminding him from from their, their experience. So they are abandoned or neglect or or they face violence. And they highlight the cycle of uh, of of the tra of the trauma and the legacy of the wartime rape and forced maternity. The next one, please. So the consequences there are in the in, in of of the rape and war in the wartime, they have uh, you know in the individual and the collective level. Becker is talking about uh, the understanding of trauma as a, in a collective experience as being an extreme traumatization that uh, uh, is uh, that exceed the ability the the psychological structures of the individual and the society to provide later an adequate response to the event so this is something that you know creates a big mark the next one please so um Judith Herman was uh, the one that uh, um based on uh, on her experience working with the long uh, of people that they have uh, prolonged exposure to trauma she created the uh, um the concept of complex PTSD because the 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 basic uh, post traumatic stress disorder criteria was not enough to uh to to uh, encompass all the symptoms and all the things that we are seeing with this and uh, in the survivors so we see um uh, uh, in the complex PTSD, they are acknowledging the fundamental aspects of the the disruptions that there are in the survivor's identity, in the relationships, and in the worldview. Uh, the sense of safety, the sense of agency, and the selfhood is being, you know, very uh, injured. Uh, the, the the erosion of the trust in oneself and another, the sense of helplessness and powerless and the distortions in the perception of time and reality and self. We see most of the people with complex PTSD that they have moments of unconsciousness, they have dissociation and confusion, that they blur the, the boundaries between what is the internal experience and the external reality, creating a sense of uh, unreality, alienation and detachment. The next one, please. Also, Van der Kock talk about this. And they say about uh, that the trauma changed the brain, and that even the the the, the, the ability to survive and adapt, uh, the people that we have this, but many of the people they get uh, stuck, and uh, and the experience of the trauma becomes uh, the the one that is constantly controlling all the the reality, and the life become colorless, and the experiences that the current experience become meaning they, they don't have meaning and they darken the presence and the future. The next one, please. So we have a lot of uh, consequences. I was talking about the the the, the psychological, but we have also physical uh, injuries and sexually transmitted infections, chronic pain. Um, we have also socioeconomic ramifications. These people they have social stigma and discrimination. They are 
difficulties later to secure employment. They have limited social networks, and they are most of them they, are, they have displacement and migration, sometimes forced and sometimes voluntary to try to escape the stigma. Next one, please. So uh, when we are trying to give a comprehensive treatment for these kind of cases, we try to do this uh, uh, giving a very comprehensive, um, you know, programs where there are treatment uh, of the physical and the and the psychological symptoms, uh, treatment for all the family, social assistance, uh, and taking in consideration that there needs to be uh, cultural sensitive the treatment and taking in consideration that we we need to be very sure that we are not trying to create any situations that can remind the situation of torture. The next one, please. Uh, so the recovery is a long-term process uh, needs to be tailored to the needs of the survivor. Uh, we need uh, to work with him about the perception of the trauma and trying to make meaning of the experience and trying to create a, a healing uh, journey. And uh, that needs to take in consideration uh, the he owns perception and the sense of self. The next one, please. So there is also a challenge for us as therapists, uh, the depth of suffering that we are seeing uh, with these the survivors may challenge our own core beliefs, our values. Uh, it's crucial for us to be getting uh, supervision, self-reflection, to try to, you know, to hope uh, to work these challenges uh, because we can have uh, secondary traumatization or compassion fatigue and burnout due to the intense emotional demands of this work being witnessing and engaging in the traumatic experience of them can elicit of in us helplessness, anger, sadness, and other kind of uh, feelings that there are that needs to be monitored to help us to help them to help them and to help us to keep ourselves uh, um, competent. Uh, I think that one of the important things uh, was um, I, I take from Elizabeth Smart that she was uh, abducted when she was a child. She was on the F14, and she said that one of the things that helped her was uh, something that the mother told her when she was rescued. And she said that the most powerful thing that you can do to help yourself to go through this uh, terrible experience is to live a life that doesn't less this to talk uh, to take your happiness that you need to live a happy life. And this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to help them to, you know, recover their own self, to be able to, uh, um, you know, give meaning to the experience, but at the same time, not to be only um, working or, 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 or busy about this, or only taking this in consideration. The next one, please. So this is, uh, I think that uh, when we are in this kind of uh, process that we are doing now, uh, one of the important things is to try to understand that we, we the uh, therapist and the, and the medical, uh, we are going through the same process, but we need to keep our perspective and we need to be able to, uh, to, to give hope. So thank you for, uh, thank you for being with us. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Kai. Uh, Somebody is asking if it's possible to get a copy of the PowerPoints. I don't think so, but it it's going to be a, a recording. Mm -hmm. uh, this this meeting is being recorded, so you uh, you'll get a copy of the of the webinar. And there's a Q and A in the top of your screen. So if you want to ask, I think we'll leave the questions to the end. So if you want mm -hmm. to write questions, you're invited. So I'll present our next uh, speaker. Thank you, Kai. Our next speaker is Ateret Gvirts Meidan. Ateret is the director of the Science of Sex Research Lab. She's an associated professor, professor in the School of Social Work in the University of Haifa, Israel. And Nathalie will talk with us about the triggers in post-trauma insights from October 7 war. Thank you. Thank you, Michal. Um, can my presentation be uploaded? Thank you.
Um, so thank you, Michal, for presenting me. My name is Atarek and I'm a sex therapist and I specialize in trauma and sexuality. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I won't really talk about how people, the reports of sexual violence. I think there is a great webinar on that, um, the unspeakable terror of gender-based violence on October 7th, which brings people's reports, um, people who survived uh, sexual violence. I will be speaking more about how we all heard the sexual violence descriptions in the media and how that kind of affected the people who heard the sexual violence through the media um, as like in a secondary trauma and how that affected a lot of people also in their emotional state, but also their sexual lives. Um, and I'm gonna bring just a general trigger alert because this presentation has a lot of um, descriptions in the media of sexual violence and, and examples. So just a trigger alert. Um, next. So when we talk about trauma, I think we have to just, this is just, this is just a touch base. We have to talk, there's two main types of trauma. There is primary trauma in which someone, the trauma happens directly to one person. Um, and there is secondary trauma when you're affected by something, by a trauma that happened to someone else, but you're either taking care of them or you saw you saw something really um, traumatic in the media. Um, and I see that a lot because I, I work with a lot of uh, trauma survivors. So I see that a lot with um, their therapists or their partners. And there is it's two different types, but we have it has to be said that the effect of the trauma can actually be the same especially when it's viewed um, in the media or you have a really, it's really illustrated or described in detail. Cause then the brain doesn't always differentiates between what happened to someone else and what happens to me. So if you view something in the media, the brain could kind of like, even it doesn't interpret it as someone else but it could interpret it to something that happened to you. So sometimes it doesn't really make a difference in terms of the effect of the trauma on, on the person, if it's secondary or primary. So I think the main message before I dive into how the sexual violence kind of affected each and every one of us, um, I think the main message is that trauma doesn't just stop with one person. It spreads out, it affects communities, uh, countries. And it's important to understand that because it drives us as therapists um, to give support to a lot of people and not just the people that of course need um, the, the support who were the survivors. Um, next, please. So, I, I just want to touch base again on, on trauma and traumatized sexuality. When it comes to studying trauma and sexual violence, we really have to be careful not to look only in on sexual dysfunction. You know, if someone had an orgasm, doesn't have an orgasm, what's the level of desire? It doesn't really give us a lot of information about what is traumatized sexuality. Traumatized sexuality, when trauma meets sexuality, it's it has very different layers um, of how it um, performs. It's You could see people that are affected by trauma, their sexuality, they could have a lot of dissociation during sexual encounters, or they could be very alert during sexual activity, they would be, they will have a hard time to relax. So that is something that, you know, I can't take, I'm, I'm still a researcher. So you can't really measure, it's really hard to measure traumatized sexuality. And this is actually a paper in which we really tried to measure it because, you know, you could ask someone, 
how often did you have sex? But then, you know, they have sex twice a week, but that, that sex is really traumatized. They're, they're dissociating during the sex. They're having a hard time to relax, enjoy themselves. They're having flashbacks during sex of sexual violence stories they heard or sexual violence they experience. Um, they have a lot of shame and guilt during sex. I'm, I feel very guilty that my brother, my um, uh, people that I know are fighting in war or people that I know died in the war and I'm having sex. So I might, you know, in terms of frequency, I might be having sex, but it's very traumatized. So I think this is very important for us therapists and, and people to know that traumatized sex is not just sexual performance, sexual function. It's, it has a lot of different layers of dissociation, triggers, flashbacks, guilt, shame, and those are the things we wanna look for. Next. Uh, so this is just what we call traumatized sex. And next. Uh, so when, when we do wanna look at it in the context of the war, I think when we talk about sexual violence and secondary trauma, we're referring to the emotional, psychological toll that it takes from us and the people who were indirectly affected by these stories. So it's caregivers, therapists, but also the general population. So let's let's take an example of a, a person who was exposed to the media coverage of the rape um, by Hamas, sexual violence by Hamas. And that is really distressing. They, I'm going to bring it up soon. They're, it's really illustrated. Um, and it's very, very graphic a lot of times. And it could be really, someone could be really affected and develop secondary trauma. I even call it secondary sexual trauma trauma because their sexuality is being affected by it. And I had patients, friends, a lot of people come up to me saying, this is stuff that I've been experiencing since October 7th. Um, flashbacks, images, um, all kind of triggers doing, during sexual activity. And I, that's just something I think we need to be aware of. Next. I'm just going to shortly say the media, it, there's kind of like a, a dissonance. I think the media is really good about um, describing sexual violence into detail. They don't do it so much with um, pleasurable sex, good sex education. Um, so that's not, that's often doesn't happen. I think that should be changed, but the media is very good with describing um, sexual violence into very detailed and graphic descriptions. So that's just something to note. Next. Um, I think we could all, we all saw these images, graphic reports, details, evidence of rape, sexual violence, and it's been all over the media. Next. The, their, the descriptions, again, you could just like scroll through and see. I'm, I'm bringing a trigger alert because I'm now going to read some stuff that were presented in the media. Um, so you could see how graphic it's been um, having sex with dead bodies, witnessed uh, two girls lying in a bedroom. One of them was half naked with her legs spread. And he said he saw, this is reports from Zaka, um, that were spread, that were appeared to be sperm on her back. There was a body of a woman that had a blood stain on her genitalia. Telegram, whoever was in Telegram saw horrific um, images and videos um, by Hamas shortly after the attack showing young, young girls, young Israeli women with um, bloodied sweatpants on their crutches. So, these are just some of the descriptions. You could, you could go next because it's really 
difficult to read that. But now there's more coming out with Amit Susana talking out, giving a very detailed prescription. Um, and you could go next. We've seen Maya Regev talk about her experiencing um, some sexual harassment. Um, next. So it's basically, um, we see it a lot. Next. Um, and it's all over the news. And I just want to say before I move to discussing this study that we just published, I think it's very important that this issue is addressed in the media. I think it brings up awareness. I think it shows what Hamas is capable of. I think it's um, I think we, we have nothing to be ashamed of. I don't think it has to be not spoken. I just want us to, I just want to raise awareness to the fact that these media coverages of sexual violence can be experienced as sexual, as secondary trauma among the general population. And that's is that is something that I've been seeing um, in clinical practice and hearing a lot of. So we published this uh, study, we kind of like right after the war um, started, we, uh, Aria, Professor Ari Lazar and Tali Rosenbaum, which will be speaking right after me, um, we wanted to see what did the wartime stress do to people's sexual well-being. Well, surprise, surprise, it didn't do well. Um, a lot of people experience a decrease in their sexual frequency, sexual desire. Um, I just want to say that when this study was published, I had a lot of soldiers text me and say, you know, this study is kind of like BS because we experience a, a large sex drive. And I just want to say the people we surveyed were people, were the general population staying at home, not soldiers. So the people who are viewing the media and are not in a very doing, uh, not often in a very doing position, but rather, you know, in the, in the, in the back, in the support, uh, they experience a sexual decrease. What we were very sad that we didn't include questions about sexual violence in this study, because actually when we went out with this survey, set the stories about sexual violence were still not out there. It took, it took some time for the stories to come out. So then we decided we're gonna do a second wave and we're gonna ask people, because when we saw this decrease in sex drive and in sexual frequency, we asked people in this study, why do you experience a decrease in your sexual drive in your sexual um for in sexual activity frequency and most people said noted emotional reasons not practical um although some people said you know my husband's in the army is in miluim and but most people noted emotional reasons you know i'm depressed i'm sad i'm not in the mood and we were we were interested in knowing how many people later on were affected by the sexual uh, violence stories that were out there. And I just wanna note something really important that touches base with what I started with. In this study, the exposure through the media was much more um, significantly affecting people's well-being, sexual well-being. Meaning if you were actually exposed to rockets or something you were your sexual well-being was less affected but rather people that were viewing the media more and more were the people who their sexual well-being was experienced more of a decrease in their sexual well-being so that is very interesting and and explains i think corresponds with what i said before that when you view something in the media it could often have the same effect and here even more on your well-being. Next. So we just have recently, this week, got data. And we asked um, three months into the war, how many people 
experience changes in their sex frequency. We were expecting to see less. Um, it was around 50% when we in the first wave, but now people 30% of men and 36% of women, um, three months into the war, when we launched this, the second wave, um, actually experienced uh, still a decrease in their sex frequency. Um, you can see, I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but you could see there's some people who have more sex, and that's very understandable and legit because people are longing for affection, connection, attachment. Um, and it's also it's also could help with emotional regulation and other stuff. But uh, next, what's interesting is that we asked how many people the exposure to sexual violence happening on October 7th and how the exposure to sexual violence during captivity, because there's descriptions of that too, how relevant was that? for their decrease in frequency of sex. Next. And you could see um, that approximately 17 to 23% of men and 22 to 24% of women experienced a decrease in sexual activity rate, rated media exposure um, of sexual violence. And nearly 25% said that this exposure to sexual violence through the media was relevant, meaning people who hear the description of sexual violence in the media, either on captivity or during October 7th, perceived it as affecting their sexuality, their frequency of sexual activity and sexual desire. Next. So I think it's very important. I'm just going to say very shortly that there is this very small meta-analysis that found that this is because I'm, I'm also talking to therapists. If you treat trauma, it's often not enough to, in, to have a relief in sexual problems. Okay, I'll, I'll explain and say, if you treat only the trauma, you're not necessarily going to see an improvement in sexual function, distress, satisfaction. You also need to directly target in therapy sexual problems when they intersect with trauma. It's really important. Um, so I think this is a very important uh, aspect that we need to acknowledge. And next. And I think it's something that we need to know because again, I said trauma is a collect, we're in a collective trauma. And we all heard stories of sexual violence and we're all affected by them. And our sexuality, you could see to almost 25%, one out of four people perceive the stories as affecting their sexuality. I just want to end and say, I joined this webinar to offer my perspective as a sex therapist and as a researcher focusing on trauma and sexuality. But I want to emphasize and say that this issue transcends political affiliations or humanitarian agendas. It's universal concern centered um, around women's well-being. And then and it's very important to address trauma uh, of sexual abuse. And again, it's regardless of one's political stance, whether pro-Palestinian, right wing, left wing, I think it's irrelevant. Um, to this subject of sexual abuse. Sexual abuse demands our attention and action. It's a matter of basic human dignity and compassion. And we must collectively advocate for their release of the hostages and work towards ensuring their safety and recovery alongside looking at how the general population has been affected. Thank you so much. Thank you, Athena, for your presentation. <coughs> Again, I'm re reminding everybody that if somebody has a question, you're invited to write it down on the Q&A. Um, and we'll leave the questions for the end. Thank you, Athena, again. So our next speaker is Andy Ifergan. 
Andy is the head of the social work services and sex, sex uh, therapy clinic in the Department of Psychiatry in the Soroka Medical Center in Beresheva. And Andy will talk about adapting me mental health trauma interventions during wartime. Andy, please. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to start by thanking ADASA International for sponsoring this webinar. Um, I started my professional career more than 30 years ago as a social worker student in the metology department at ADASA in Karem. So this is kind of the closure for me to be here with you. Um, on October 7th, 680 wounded people in body and soul arrived at the Soroka Medical Center in Beersheba. This is by far the high number in the world of wounded people admitted at one day by a single hospital. Since then, Soroka has continued to admit wounded soldiers. Due to our short distance from the Gaza Strip, the soldiers referred to us were those who were defined in the field as having moderate, severe, and critical injuries. To date, near 6,000 wounded have arrived at the hospital. In my presentation, as Michal said, I will focus on the clinical work of the mental health team at Soroka, emphasizing the adaptations we made to the traditional model of acute stress interventions to adapt them to the unique situation of this war. Um, I will divide our clinical work uh, and insights into three periods of time. The first one, of course, is it's October the 7th itself. The second one is the first month. And this, the last one will be the beginning of the war up to the present day. On a personal level, my Saturday morning on October the 7th started at 6.31 with an air raid siren. siren. We immediately went to their shelter, me, my husband, our kids. As residents of the south of Israel, we are used to periodical in, in escalations, but still very quickly, we, re we realized that we were dealing with something much more serious than a regular escalation. Soroka Hospital declared such situation as a high level mass casualty incident. The moment that happened, I was called to the hospital because my job during an emergency is to be head of the paramedical team at the mental health emergency center in the ER. We had never experienced in Soroka and I think in the country, such many casualties from so many different scenes. Casualties were, the first casualties admitted were the Nova Party, which I didn't know that party existed. Um, casualties were brought from the communities surrounding the Gaza Strip, uh, wounded policemen, wounded soldiers, wounded civilians uh, from the population of the South and family of missing persons. Most of the department staff arrived, even though it was a Saturday and a holiday. Some were called in and some just arrived to the hospital. And I think the devotion and commitment of the staff that, that day and, and on was immense. Um, I will try to give you a glimpse of the therapeutic adaptations we had to make that day in order to, um, to adapt them to the unique situation we were in. And the first one refers to the change of the traditional perception of the therapeutic setting. In a mass casualty incident, we, the psychiatry department, are responsible for the mental health uh, emergency center, which is physically into the ER complex. And people are referred to it. And we, we were sitting, sitting there and we saw that no one is coming, no one came. And I say to myself, what's happening here? And I decided to go out, uh, out our center into the ER. It was horrifying. It looked like a field hospital in a World War II movie. That's that was I thought at the moment. All the ear spaces were full and crowded. At that moment, I realized that the reason people were not, not were not coming to the mental health center was that most of them were physically injured and they couldn't come. And this required us to make the first and maybe the most important adaptation that day reaching out, going out of the mental health emergency center and into the emergency rooms and not waiting for referrals in the center. 
The implementation of that decision was that acute stress interventions were mostly done standing up near to the patient's bed in an environment that we are not used to. It's not sterile from a therapeutic point of view. Interventions were performed in the city queue, besides beds when the only thing separating one bed for another is a curtain and so on. The second adaptation we had to make was in the type of interventions itself. A large part of the intervention was humanitarian, providing a mobile phone charger to a soldier in order that he could talk to his parents and tell them that he was safe and sound, bringing shoes to those who came from the party barefoot, providing water and food to the wounded. Looking back, I understand that one of the most important things that we did by doing that was to be human beings in a hardly human situation. On that day, many ident unidentified wounded arrived at Soroka Hospital to respond in addition to the registra registration every identified wood person has the social work service established a database of all the unidentified wounded person who were received that day. Part of our intervention included accompanying wounded and unwounded people who came to the hospital to look for their loved ones, hoping to find them, and checking the database of pictures and names to find people who might have been admitted to the hospital. Sadly, we found very few. We couldn't know at the time that most of them were already murdered or kidnapped. All we could do was to be there for them as a supporting environment in a horrifying and unbearable situation. The third adaptation we had to make was adapting the stress intervention model itself. Every mental health professional who works in a hospital is familiar with stress intervention. One of the, the things we usually tell patients is the event is over, you're in a safe place now. We realize that the event was not remotely over and that there, were, there was no such place as a safe place. You can't tell someone whose house is being burned down or who doesn't know what happened to their children that the event is over and they're safe. Most of Israel was not a safe place that day. Naturally, the traditional components of acute stress intervention were present, such as cognitive reconstruction of the event, strengthening the sources, the resources, psychoeducation, processing feelings of guilt that everybody had without exception that day. That day I heard dozens of stories of incredible resource resourcefulness thanks to which they arrived to the hospital, wounded but alive. In retrospect, we believe that these changes helped to make our interventions more effective and relevant to the people who were affected that day. On October the 8th, Soroka stopped all outpatient activities, both because all resources were directed to the emergency and because it was dangerous to come to the hospital since the bumping continued. We physically continued our activity from the emergency room in the same emergency center where we were the day before. Well, I headed the paramedical team, my colleague and friend, Dr. Tamar Kusef, a specialist psychiatrist, headed a psychiatrist. The instruction the, we were given that was that Every soldier would be evaluated by a, by a mental health professional. Every morning started in the ER with both of us going through the list of wounded patients and consultations requested from us by the different departments. Sadly, each morning started with a heartbreak routine since there were new names every morning, every day. We had to make decisions on which professional to say to which case. It was necessary to decide whether we send a man or a woman, an Arab or a Jew. I will explain a little bit on that because when a soldier came, sometimes hearing even Arab accent was a trigger. So we had to, to, to be very uh, accurate to the needs of the soldier of the civilian that came. We have to decide whether to send a staff member who is also a sex therapist. We had 
more than a dozen uh, patient with uh, genitalia, wound, uh, gen, um, wounded uh, urological injuries. We decided uh, another decision we made that in difficult cases, two members would go together. The same decision was made regarding inexperienced team members. They went, they were sent with the veteran team, member of the team, to gain confidence before performing intervention by themselves. If on October 7th, we understood that the event was not remotely over, it was even more clear the following weeks, rockets continued to fall. There were many missing people. The wounded from the October 7th residents of the community surrounding the other strip who were discharged had no home to return. Now imagine yourself, you have, you, you, you are hospitalized, you have to return home where you're comfortable, but there is no home. There was a need to be creative in thinking about the places of discharge, since not always the hotel had the appropriate conditions for a wounded person. The interventions included address addressing the feelings of guilt and shame that almost all the wounded had, often in a very unjustified, unfolded way. For example, survival guilt, guilt that others were more injured than them, guilt about they acted in the event, and so on. Um, during the visits, sometimes the family and friends caused more harm than good. Information and disinformation would spread around the hospital with people visiting multiple departments with wounded patients. Unfortunately, many times they would share news on other family members and friends who had passed away, murdered, adding to the already existing feeling of loneliness about among the hospitalized uh, patients. Due to the evacuations and the danger of arriving at the hospital, family and friends would not always be able to visit, leaving the patient feeling even more isolated. One of the things we do during stress intervention is asking persons, patients, about the resources they have to cope, they use usually. One of the things we noticed was that some patients are unable, were unable to use the resources they have used in the past, as those resources may no longer be, be, be available. For example, um, a person who used to cope with stress by cooking at home, but there is no home and she not, cannot cook. Or um, a person who used to share his feeling with his best friend, but it's, his best friend is killed or kidnapped. So as healthcare, healthcare professionals, we have to be very innovative in helping our patients find alternative resources to cope with stress. Some of our suggestions included making video calls with family members or, or identifying other significant person, uh, people to, to share with. Um, typically, every department has its own social worker. However, to ensure consistency and care and maintain a therapeutic relationship, we had to decide, we decided, sorry, that the same therapist who had initiated the intervention with a wounded person would continue to work with that individual, even if they moved to a different department. Another thing that we learned is that we do not always get to finish the intervention, to end the intervention due to the patient transferred to another hospital in the center of Israel or closer to his home. So in order to preserve that continuity of care and give clinical recommendations, we created a model where we proactively contacted the receiving department after the patient was discharged from Soroka. Um, another thing that we realized in addition to our work with our patient that we must look up for the staff. On October the 7th, staff from all sectors and departments in the hospital were exposed to horrifying and traumatic styles, as well as emotional stress, of course. Some of them developed stress symptoms and needed short-term intervention to return to function. So we built a model of three sessions of acute interventions to help the staff in distress, conducted by staff members uh, from the psychiatry department. From the beginning of the war uh, till now, Soroka Medical Center continues to receive wounded soldiers. As the fighting continues, the intervention 
have taken different emphasis and I will share with you, um, so it's the last period I will share with you some of the insights, the insights that we have gained. Uh, the first one is uh, we know that in addition to the soldier, there is a need for interventions with the family too. The family is a crucial part of the, fam of the soldier's rehabilitation. We realize that in many of the cases that cannot be done by the same therapist. And to this end, we created a model when such a need arises, the department social worker will do the, um, the intervention with the family while the mental health specialist will work with the soldier. Um, one of the gasps that stood up uh, be stood out between the soldier and the family were the different stages in accepting the disability and the mourning process. For example, if a soldier has lost a limb and he was being sedated and ventilated for days or weeks, during that period of time, the family had time to process, to digest the injury, to be thankful that he's alive. Um, but when the, world, the soldier would wake up, from his point of view, he only left Gaza yesterday, the day before. And um, we already, um, uh, the, the parents were already in the stage that they were grateful that while well, their son was uh, only beginning to start the grieving point, the grieving process, sorry. Second, we learned that the traumatic event was not often the injury itself, but the loss of family, the, sorry, the loss of friends, uh, or traumatic experience that they came up from the month of uh, fighting in Gaza, feelings of guilt about staying alive and more. During the, uh, the, um, the fighting, there was no time to mourn friends. Most soldiers could not go to the funeral or the shiva. And it's precisely in the hospital where there is a lot of time to think that these things would go, come up to service, to surface, sorry. So therefore the intervention should, we, we understood that the, the intervention should not start by the event of the, um, uh, um, but the, um, the 7th of October. So, uh, and sometimes um, we had to give the space for intervention to the process uh, of the morning. Sometimes the soldier didn't know that uh, friends and uh, were, were killed in the same event where he was injured. Uh, so we have to work also with that. Uh, and third, we have seen more than once that the, tra the traumatic events come, continue to happen uh, to occur even during hospitalization because the fighting continue and there are losses of friends and staff. Unfortunately, in these cases, the information was usually received from the news or social media and not in a controlled manner. So we helped in going up to, to funerals, to Shiva, intervention, helping during the first steps of loss on mourning and commemoration. One of the mo most innovative things that we have done uh, since the beginning of the war till today was interventions in the field of sexuality already in the ICU when there is a genital related injury and the, area, and the re rehabilitation department, we establish an entry intervention model with wounded soldiers and their partners regarding sexuality. Um, I cannot end, and this will be my, fin my, my final statement, but I cannot end the presentation without mentioning the sheer reality of October the 7th. I live in the South of Israel. Most of the people that work at Soroka are resident of the Negev the same place where the attacks took place. Uh, we lost a doctor, a nurse was kidnapped and thankfully returned to us safely. Staff member were recruited for reserve duty the same day. Staff member were living communities near the Gaza Strip were in imminent danger. We all know families that lost homes and were evacuated. Family members of many of us were on active duties and in danger and almost all of us lost someone, myself included, friends, colleagues, family, and patients too. Um, I believe though that even though the share reality took a toll of one of us, it also made us better. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, Andy, very much. Um, thanks. So our 
Last speaker for today will be Tali Rosenbaum. Tali will talk about trauma and resi resilience, identity, connection, and integration. Tali is an individual and couple therapist. She's a certified sex therapist in private practice. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Tali. Thank you. I think we should all kind of take a minute and breathe. Um, it's been really an intense and meaningful evening. And so um, I'm going to close. I'm going to close and I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to zoom out because unlike Andy, um, who was really in the thick of things in the South, I live in a community in central Israel called Beit Shemesh. And uh, I think that as a community therapist, I'd like to bring a little bit of the more um, communal and collective trauma response and talk about issues of identity, connection, integration, and resilience. So any talk about trauma and resilience should start with a quote from Viktor Frankl. So I'm going to as well. And Viktor Frankl said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And I'd like to talk a little bit about our process here, our process of trauma and disconnection, but also a, a growth towards, a process towards growth and towards post-traumatic growth and towards repair. So a traumatic event has been described as a watershed moment, which divides life into before and after. And since October 7th, we in Israel have experienced a collective trauma and it's gonna change us. It already has changed us. And it's changed us as individuals, in our relationships and as a society. Now, the initial response to trauma, as many of us know, is to survive it. We activate our survival mechanisms, whether it's fight, flight, sometimes freeze if we can't fight or flight. And then when the threat is over, our bodies and our minds recover. We're no longer under threat. However, we're in a situation of ongoing stress and ongoing threat. And so we need to learn to adapt by keeping our responses, our stress responses, easily accessible. And we might refer to this as uh, hypervigilance or being on high alert. Um, but what we also know, and what I know as a couples therapist and what I talk about a lot, is that being hypervigilant and being uh, overly alert is also dissonant with what you need for connection and for intimacy. We often say as couples therapists that our survival responses are great for surviving, but they're not necessarily very relational. So what I'd like to talk about is how experiencing this traumatic event can harm our ability to regulate our emotions. And emotional regulation is necessary to, to feel safe and to feel secure. But I also want to say that what we do as humans is we tend to, when we can't self-regulate, is try to co-regulate. We tend to look around and look for the person who might help us calm down. And I think that this is part of our resilience. And what I'm gonna talk about are kind of my observations as a community therapy therapist and speak about them from a perspective and frame them as part of our collective resilience. You know, we talk a lot about PTSD. It's really hard to talk about post-traumatic stress when we're still under threat. Um, but, you know, it's, we're six months in, we still feel threat. And so what I wanna focus in on this talk is, is not so much the ways in which we have been traumatized, but more the ways in which many of us in the outer circles of trauma, but also in the very inner circles, um, how we have experienced this war and how it may be predictive for healing, for resilience and for post-traumatic growth. I wanna highlight the protective role of um, resources, such as all the trauma-informed early interventions, the collective responsibility, the volunteerism, uh, the seeking of relational, communal and professional connection. So rather than talk about how we are, I'd like to talk a little bit about who we are and how these events have affected and changed us 
individually as well as in our various relationships. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about identity. I'm gonna talk about our beliefs, our roles, and our relationships. So let me start with identity. We know that traumatic events can challenge and reshape our identities individually and collectively. It's kind of like we have to relearn how to navigate the process of reconstructing ourselves. You know, we, we are defined by so many different roles, mother, grandmother, professional, daughter, uh, son, um, husband, wife, uh, Haredi, secular. We have so many different ways of defining ourselves. And this war has suddenly presented a whole new set of identities. I'm a Nova survivor. I'm a family of a hostage. I'm a, I'm a hostage. I'm parents of, children of, wives of, soldiers, bereaved, friends of bereaved. I mean, I, I have good friends. I'm, I'm in my early 60s, so I have a couple of good friends who are widowed. But I never thought that my 23-year-old daughter and my 30-year-old daughter would also now take on this identity of friends of widows at that at that such, such a young age. And we've also blurred some of our roles. I think that um, Andy referred to this before about how we have to adapt our rigid rules during trauma. And uh, many people in caretaker roles, doctors, therapists, will talk about how their patients and clients would ask them, and how are you doing? And who do you have in the army? And you know, a lot of us as therapists talked about how do we answer that when our therapist, when our client wants to check in on us. And that's a whole other webinar, but I won't go into the answers to that. So that's new identities, but we also have had to deal with new belief systems and new feelings that we might not have had before. Um, we have beliefs, we have our values, we have our attitudes about peace, about politics, about religion, about God. And I think for many of us, those beliefs were really shaken up. Many of us felt really betrayed. What, what do I believe in now? If I believed in peace, what do I believe in now? It, it, it can be very, very undermining. Um, as uh, Andy referred to as well, um, people really spoke a lot about guilt especially in the early days. I feel guilty. I'm not dead. I don't know anybody dead. I'm not close enough to the inner circle of death. Um, I Yes, I, I don't have any children in the army. I do have children in the army, but he's not an Aza. He's up north. So right away, there's an understanding that there's a hierarchy of trauma, but this can also too be framed as resilience, this way of kind of saying it's not so bad. It's worse for others. Um, and I think that altogether, these kind of ways of coping um, can point to some uh, kind of communal built in, maybe even um, intergenerational, uh, a legacy of resilience. And what about our new roles, whether they're professional or otherwise? I can say this as a therapist right away from the very first week. Um, I was not one of the therapists who ran down to the Dead Sea to take care of um, people who were uh, who, who were displaced. Um, and many of us who did not do that were very, very busy every evening, sharing information, listening to webinars every, every evening and being very interested those in, in becoming more trauma-informed, those who uh, were not, and learning techniques and trying to help. And the media also, the media, would come out with, you know, together we'll be victorious, um, commercials about how to prevent trauma, the, the headlines, in abnormal times, all responses are normal, um, things that I don't know were being said 50 years ago in the Yom Kippur War. In fact, there really wasn't um, enough uh, discussion then about trauma, uh, and certainly not about uh, maintaining or um, trying to repair uh, intimate relationships in times of trauma. I also wanna say something about comedy. Um, we Israelis are pretty funny. We really appreciate humor almost right away, comedy satires. And those satires also included satires about couples and about intimacy, um, funny clips about soldiers coming home and the music and the, and the hugging. And then right away there were 
um, clips about soldiers coming home to a wife who said, oh, you're home, bye-bye, and left him to the dishes and the kids. And, and this really indicates an awareness. What are the issues that um, couples will encounter, are encountering? Um, you know, this, this, this um, way we have about talking about everything, not, not any, nothing being sacred, um, is a type of resilience, activism, hasbara. Um, I could talk about that in a minute, but I can also talk about the cooking, the volunteering, the collecting, the picking. So many people, this collective response, um, these are coping mechanisms and they're predictors to resilience because not only do people feel busy and effective, uh, it also makes them feel that they're part of something. And the antidote to trauma is connection. And these endeavors created a real system of social support and sharing. And we, we certainly know that that buffers the effects of trauma and it fosters resilience. I could say that um, one of my kind of fight mechanisms to, to stress to trauma was to get on social media and be very active um, and outspoken and kind of annoying about um, the sexual health organizations that failed to um, that 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 failed to come out against the the horrible um, sexual violence that occurred to us, and uh, I certainly felt betrayed. My colleagues felt betrayed. My Jewish colleagues around the world felt betrayed, but it also gave them a new role as 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 an identity as Jewish therapists and many alternate. Uh, Jewish sex therapy and other trauma therapy and other little groups that I'm on um, were formed um, based on these feelings of isolation, victimization, but going towards the, um, the direction of empowerment um, and of collective kind of being there for one another. So I am a relationship therapy, so I do want to talk a little bit about what relationships and what I saw in my practice in the early um, in the early weeks of the war and later. Um, in the face of threat, um, you know, the safety and security of a committed partnership can be a very comforting resource resource, but couples under stress often respond differently. And what was interesting to me was that I was already seeing couples. I didn't have you know, a lot of new people coming because my practice was full and it stayed full. But the couples that I was working with, the same dynamics that I was working in them, like one couple, the husband who was a, you know, a fight, flight, flyer, he always kind of, when the going got tough, he would run away. He was a, an avoidant um, and uh, he would get really stressed out. And like on moving day, he was nowhere to be found. He ran, he ran off. Um, so that's what happened the day after the war. He booked a flight for the whole family to leave. And this, these aren't people who were here for a visit. They're, these were people, this is a family that made Aliyah. And there were quite a few families where um, there was a lot of immediate tension about the different fight flight responses where one partner um, wanted to spend all day volunteering and the other one wanted to hunker down at home or one partner wanted to leave the country, the other one didn't. So part of couples therapy, which has always been true, and this has certainly been true during this war, is learning to regulate yourself emotionally, um, learning to be really self-aware and learning to resolve conflict because we want the couple relationship not to be an added source of conflict in this already very conflictual environment that we're in, but to become a source of connection and of calm. So the war has affected couples and it has affected intimate relationships as well, as you saw from the study um, that Atara did and uh, that we did. And um, we can likely predict that uh, there will be uh, a lot of resources and awareness of trauma and relationships and studies, more studies about trauma and relationships. And this is very different than what it was like in the Yom Kippur War. Um, there are very few studies and the studies that that uh, did come out after the Yom Kippur War, years after the Yom Kippur War, longitudinal studies that looked at um, uh, relationships, uh, you know, were, were, were studies that really indicated that couples did not talk about their uh, intimate lives together. 
Uh, a word about sex. Um, I am sex therapist, and so uh, I will say something about sex. Even if we factor out the issues such as guilt, you know, how can I have pleasure when people are suffering, when the hostages still haven't come home, or if we factor out the images that Atara talked about, the you know the um, images in my head of, the, of what I saw on the media and how it won't go away, and I can't even. Uh, relax into sex because I'm thinking about all these horrible things. I can't come down. We also have to recognize that the physiological experience of sexual arousal itself is similar to the fight or flight response. Your heart rate goes up. Your your you know your your heart starts to pound. That's when you're normally aroused. So if you are in a constant state of stress, or if you have symptoms of acute stress. And certainly that we know that this is true for PTSD. Sexual arousal can um, be too arousing, not the sexual arousing way, but the neurophysiological arousing way, in a way that you then can't balance the, the down regulators. You can't calm yourself down. And it doesn't help that you're worried about hearing a siren. It doesn't help that you have these images. But understanding that you know, in order to feel safe and secure in sex, you have to be able to really let go. Um, and that's what, you know, we know from uh, the body keeps the score. We know that in order to be able to uh, heal, we have to be able to experience the embodied experience of safety. So um, that's what we're trying to do all the time is try to breathe, try to meditate, try to take moments of relaxation, um, even when when we zoom back in, we're not really safe and we know we're not, um, but we're trying to balance these realities together. So to close, I just wanna add a couple of factors that are related to resilience and they were talked about before here. Um, it's certainly adaptability. Our ability to survive is in our adaptation. It's in our ability to not be rigid, to think out of the box, um, using positive, coping strategies, seeking social support, practicing self-care, trying to draft our prefrontal cortices as much as possible so that we can problem solve, and to try to maintain a positive outlook, try to maintain a sense of humor, try to still have fun when we can. You know, the um, headline of Nova is, we will dance again. Um, seeking social support, strong social connections, being resilient, um, relying on ourselves, being self, you know, self-efficacy in the face of adversity. And finally, um, well, not finally, also emotionally regulating ourselves, um, the ability to manage and regulate ourselves effectively, being aware of our feelings, our sensations, being able to express them, um, and also seeking purpose, seeking meaning, um, trying to create growth opportunities and learning opportunities um, and trying to derive lessons from this very, very difficult and painful time. And so as we close, I can just say that, um, you know, I think we, we really can just continue to hope and pray for better times for all the hostages to come home and for us to be able to live in peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tali, very much. What a way to finish our evening. If uh, the speakers are here and want to open your cameras, you're invited. Um, if you are wondering why we talk about sex, it's because this seminar was organized by the Israeli Society for Sex Therapy. It's not that in Israel, we everybody talks about sex all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in this evening, we went through so many emotions and we heard so many things and it will take a while to digest and to, to understand. And we are still in that process that every moment we feel complex, strong feelings sometimes all at once we can be both uh, full of gratitude for what we have and still very challenged with very with sadness and loss and we are we have we are having everything together um i'm full of admiration and i'm thankful for all, all the speakers 
that accept the invitation to come here. I'm very grateful for all the people abroad and in Israel that are listening to us. We feel you and the connection that we have in Israel with the people in the diaspora and vice versa. I think it's very important for all of us. So we we thank you very much to Adasa again, Adasa International, to Jorge, to HTOP, to Shir, to Jan. And if you have any questions or the panelists when panelists want to say anything else, you're invited. I I don't see question, uh, questions from the Yeah, I don't see questions from the public. Well, so good night or good day, buen dia for those are that are in South or Central America. And that's it for tonight. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.